Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the whole organising committee and particularly Jose for the invitation. Um, I think my voice is a bit husky from the liquid hospitality yesterday, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to jump straight into this. Um, as you heard, it's about nutrient timing and metabolic regulation today. So this is all on one screen. We've got this shared experience of living on this rock spinning through space where we all experience pretty much 12 hours of light and dark over the year. And as a starting point then, we know that our daily meals occur there. Most of us go for this three square meals a day, as you heard. And there's a couple of implications of that that will kind of form a basis for this talk today. One being that we are therefore pretty much in a permanent postprandial state. If we're thinking of lipid metabolites, I'd argue that many of us are in a fed postprandial state 24 hours a day, but even more acute responses like to carbohydrate, most of us are certainly postprandial for all of our waking hours. So that means the only time you're truly fasting is probably while you're asleep. And the second implication of that is then that most of our eating occasions occur in an already fed state. Whereas, of course, we know the vast majority of research is done with overnight fasted people. So I'll be trying to argue here that we should do a lot more research studying people eating on top of already having eaten that day. And working around the clock from A to E, I'm going to start by just very briefly talking a little about meal timing. Then on metabolic rhythms, talk about circadian rhythms. I'll come on to this second meal effect, but the main focus will be this alternate day fasting or intermittent fasting model that we've looked at. And finally, to look at nutrient delivery patterns. Um, and there, I will be sharing some very new data. I knew this was a focused gr interest group, so I'm keen to share the newest data. This did mean my PhD student, Harry, was sending me graphs while I was on the train yesterday. So hot off the press. And I apologize if I haven't got it all worked out yet, and I'll appreciate help working it out. So we'll start in the top left up here. Um, I like to go back to the original landmark studies where possible. I'm going to fall off the stage today. Um, so this is a group nearly 60 years ago in Prague who looked at meal frequency and health. I've drawn a modern graph from that. This is essentially a composite measure of percent of healthy people. And what this paper 60 years ago was showing us is this very clear observation that if you eat fewer times in a day, low feeding frequency, then you don't tend to be as healthy. And this, over the last 60 years or so, has just been repeatedly shown. Normally, if people are not eating three meals a day, breakfast is the one they miss. And this observation has been incredibly consistent. A group of editors at American Journal of Clinical Nutrition helpfully collated all of the literature on this, and they worked out that even by 2011, our confidence in the fact that breakfast skipping is related to poor health had a p-value of less than 10 to the minus 42. So that's a p-value like that, if you ever see those in papers. So to put that in context, we're not talking about, so a p-value tells us what's the chance of seeing all those clear findings if in fact they're all wrong. And, and uh, there is no effect to find. This isn't a one in a thousand or one in a million probability. It's one in the number of atoms in the observable universe or the probability of shuffling a deck of cards and them being all in order. So we can be as confident as any scientist can ever be that meal timing has some correlation with health. And I hasten to add it's a correlation. These are all observational studies supporting this. We don't have the causality there. And there's a strong possibility, I would argue, of reverse causation. So what does this mean? It means what we need to do is move on from those cross-sectional associations and start to study meal timing with causal intervention studies, randomized control trials, with control, carefully administered interventions, and I would argue also mechanistic measures so we can understand how the physiology is regulated. So I'll try and show you some of those studies today that, that we've conducted at Bath. I'm not going to talk at length about circadian rhythms, but suffice to say, I'm sure you've uh, read about them too. This is repeating cycles of metabolism and behavior on a daily basis. And your body learns these rhythms from a number of stimuli, but the core ones are here. These repeating cycles on a daily basis of light and dark cycles, as I've mentioned, then we have photosensors, particularly in our eyes, but not exclusively, that tell you when it's light and dark. That's closely related to sleep and wakefulness or rest and activity. And then critically, when we're thinking about meal timing today, we know that these fasted fed 
transitions on a daily basis. And all these different cycles then can either be synchronous or asynchronous with implications for health. If you're interested in looking into all of the kind of elegant molecular machinery that explains that, then my PhD student Harry, uh, Harry did write this um, review in March this year that really talks through all of the, the clockwork in our cells, and I think he did a great job on that. Um, I'm going to talk now about the studies we've done on this. And my rationale for the studies we've done is, is really twofold. One is people haven't studied humans a whole lot in this area. There's a vast literature on rodents that's been really invaluable in understanding mammalian physiology in the mammalian circadian timing system. But I think there's a few key things there that justify looking at humans. One, rodents are nocturnal. So they eat at night, they're active at night, and they, well, they pretty much eat continuously 24 hours due to their relatively fast metabolic rate for their mass. So they do need to eat continuously. They react to fasting very differently to humans in some ways. So we need to study humans there. And also then, a lot of the studies that have been done in humans have involved quite extreme changes in where the sleep occurs. So what we wanted to use is a model called, there's constant routines where you keep people awake and feed them through the night. And sorry, do some wonderful studies in that area. We wanted to do a semi-constant routine. This means we had participants in the laboratory for 48 hours straight in Daytime, normal daylight hours, we've got 800 lux on the lights, but then zero lux at night, and they've got that sleep opportunity. But we fed them continuously during daylight hours. These were oral boluses, so they're having a meal replacement just continuously during waking time. This is Ian Templeman, who ran these studies. And you can see here what we're doing is we took muscle biopsies serially throughout the entire period. So we're stopping taking the biopsy from people, including during sleep. Of course, they do wake up for a muscle biopsy, but we've got this down to two minutes or so, that it's just a quick wake up, biopsy, back to sleep. And we've got good data to show that that short wake up doesn't completely invalidate the entire model. So I'll show you two elements of the data from this study then. Um, on the left is the muscle data here. This was a study you'll find in PNAS that we published looking at the lipidomic analysis of those muscle samples. I've picked on sphingolipids here because any time you hear omics, there's going to be hundreds of figures. But these sphingolipids were really a typical response for all of the other class and species of lipid metabolites we measured, showing this nadir in uh, availability at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and the peaks about 4 o'clock in the morning. I pick on the sphingolipids because they're particularly interesting as a membrane lipid involved in insulin signaling and regulating glucose uptake. Moving from the muscle then to some blood data, just to orientate you to this figure because I show a few like this, the grayed out line in the background is our melatonin response. So that's, I wouldn't say the word master regulator, but this is a very robust controller of your daily rhythm. So it's interesting to see that that's doing the expected bell-shaped response when people are asleep in the dark. This paper we had in JAP, we reported leptin, and I believe for the first time ghrelin, our hunger hormone concentrations, in the context of this semi-constant diurnal routine. So we can reveal a diurnal response here whereby leptin drops during the day and comes up towards the end of the day, and ghrelin shows the opposite response, kind of consistent with this broad, maybe oversimplistic view that leptin is for satiety and, and ghrelin is your hunger hormone. But what I really wanted to show you, because those two are published, but for new data, some of the new results we have in the, just the last couple of days is um, uh, Harry Smith here is just pre preparing this for publication, is a few other blood markers. So starting in the top left here, you can see insulin in the same context, and that's rather predictable. We're seeing a diurnal response here whereby insulin is elevated when feeding. You withdraw the feed because people can't eat while they're asleep, or can they? and then it drops down, lower down. So we don't know from this study, as an observational study, whether that drop is something diurnal or the withdrawal of nutrition. I suspect the latter. Looking across the bottom, we can ask questions about the catabolic, anabolic milieu in the body. So cortisol and testosterone are well established to have a circadian rhythm. And actually here, you don't see any acute effect of the withdrawal of nutrition at night. They're both doing what they're supposed to, elevating towards the morning. 
But I don't know about you, when I think about anabolism and catabolism in the body, we tend to think about muscle because it has this capacity to um, expand and be lost. But actually, it's important to think about bone turnover too. So we were happy to collaborate with Dave Clayton at Nottingham to get this CTX marker, collagen telopeptide crosslinks. This is a measure of bone resorption, so bone turnover. And you see here a really robust rhythm where that drops down during the day and then elevated at night. So keep that one in mind because just like with insulin here, right now we can't say whether that was due to dark sleep or the fact that nutrition was withdrawn at night because to, to separate those things, you would have to feed people while they are asleep, which I mentioned you can't do, but I'll show you a study later where that's, that's what we have done. And then finally, um, we have some gene expression here. Heat maps are always very pretty, but I don't find them super easy to interpret. Essentially what you're seeing here is a group of genes we looked at using PCR. The little clocks down here illustrate when we've detected rhythmicity, so it's encouraging that most of the circadian genes are showing that. Interestingly for me though, a lot that are implicated in carbohydrate and lipid metabolism come up, but also autophagy, which is a process I'll finish the talk talking about with some nighttime measures of autophagic flux. As I say though, I don't find these heat maps super helpful in terms of seeing the pattern. Um, where you can see that pattern is if I zoom back out again, in the middle of the big clock here, this eLife paper, the circadian folks out there like to present these phase distribution graphs. So this is meant to correspond to the clock times. What we found through this transcriptomic analysis is through quantifying nearly 14,000 genes, around 6,000 of them in skeletal muscle, and I, I believe these are the first data actually to look at this diurnal rhythm in human skeletal muscle, showed, they showed rhythmicity over 24 hours. And about 1,000 of those was really high amplitude, so if, if that means something. And interestingly, when you look at the phase distribution, we see accumulation of gene transcript at two core parts of the day, a kind of tick-tock, if you like, where there's this accumulation at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and an accumulation about 4 o'clock in the morning. And when you look at that long list of genes, it does appear that the ones that are peaking in the afternoon seem to be those that we commonly see in studies when we're looking at muscle contraction or mitochondrial activity so active ones, whereas the genes that are peaking in the night time seem to be more those that are implicated in immune function and inflammation. For now, I'd also just say keep that four o'clock in mind in the afternoon because the later study I'll show you, we kind of try and target that as a time to transition between feeding states. Okay, so very briefly, I'll just talk about the, this second meal effect, the fact that we get a different response to eating our second meal. This is sometimes called the Staub-Traugott effect after the two authors who arguably first observed it in 1921, although there's a couple of papers here from uh, 1919 and 1913 that observed this. So this has been long established that if you have a given meal in the morning, particularly carbohydrate, you control your blood sugar better at the next meal. That's the second meal effect. I can illustrate that here from an older study we published. Um, this is N. Haddon Judith who ran this work. You can see in this study, this is insulin. The blue line is someone has breakfast, a very carbohydrate rich breakfast you can see from the peak concentrations. And the red line is when they miss breakfast. Then we provide them the same test lunch and you can see a much attenuated response when they've had breakfast. That's a classic example of this second meal effect for glucose and insulin. The couple of things I'll add to that today is to show you that we've also observed that for acylated ghrelin. And I mean, this is a really remarkable finding, I think, that there's a second meal effect for our hunger hormone too. So we all think of ghrelin as a hunger hormone, it's suppressed when you eat, but perhaps that's only true for the first meal of the day. They have their cornflakes here and it's suppressed. It's actually back to the exact same mean three hours later, and then with that pasta lunch here, absolutely no suppression whatsoever. So maybe ghrelin only is suppressed with the first meal of the day. Uh, and there was a similar second meal effect for leptin that we showed in that paper. I should say that both, both of these studies here, we're looking there at um, a very high carbohydrate breakfast, very sugary breakfast. So it seems a bit of a false economy to try and attenuate your glucose response at lunch by eating a massive amount of sugar in the morning. So 
One paper that we're just preparing now from Harry Smith, we have used a more modest carbohydrate breakfast, and the blue line, um, uh, the, uh, the, it's, uh, in fact, the blue line here is the protein added. If we put whey protein into the breakfast, you can still achieve this. So you really don't need a massive amount of sugar in the morning to elicit this second meal effect three hours later. Okay, the next thing is kind of the, the, the middle and main part of the talk, I would say, is to look at alternate day fasting. And coming back to this idea that four o'clock in the afternoon might be an important time when our body's transitioning between expecting food or not. And specifically, I'm going to talk about this paper that we published last year in Science Translational Medicine. Just to give a brief background to this, um, it was alternate day fasting. And you may be aware that there's a hypothesis out there, I don't personally conform to it, but that there's something magical about fasting. There are fasting-mediated benefits of being on these intermittent fasting diets that will improve your health above and beyond any weight loss that it achieves. So certainly if you fast, you can lose weight and that might have beneficial effects. But the question is whether fasting does anything special in of itself. And supposedly that is due to depletion of liver glycogen, switching to lipid-derived substrates and can improve insulin sensitivity. And there was even a lot of suggestions in the literature that these fasting diets would elicit weight loss and help preserve muscle mass better than a standard diet. But to achieve those mechanisms, you need people to fast for 16 hours or more. And I really felt that a lot of the studies out there that were called alternate day fasting still allowed the participants for practical reasons to have the odd meal here and there. So to me then that isn't fasting at all. If you've eaten something, you are not fasting. So we wanted to do a study where we would have people fast for lengthy periods. So it was 24 hours on, 24 hours off, with three or four in the afternoon as the point of that transition between feeding and fasting each day. And we wanted to measure the, the effect on humans doing that and see if there is any effect on metabolism and body composition. So just to talk you through the graphical abstract here, um, if we start on the left, these, this is the baseline situation. So we have weight-stable individuals, therefore they're eating their normal diet, doing their normal activity, and they're weight-stable. So we should be expecting some degree of energy balance there. They are then randomized into one of three treatment groups with the objective of isolating the effect of fasting separate from the effect of weight loss. So group one, let's call this the control group. This is like standard dieting. They consume 25% fewer calories every single day for three weeks and we see the effect. So that's 75% of their normal intake. The middle group here is alternate fasting with the same energy restriction. So they're going to restrict their calories by the same net amount but by eating zero calories for 24 hours and then being prescribed 150% of normal. So the mathematicians among you have already figured out that that's a net 25% reduction, same as the first group. And then the most difficult group to be in, who I'm, who I'm most grateful to for doing this, they did alternate day fasting without energy restriction. So they would eat nothing for 24 hours and then eat double their normal amount of food. So they're then getting the same alternate day fasting, but without the energy restriction. I've kind of summarized the findings in the graphical abstract, that while diet was reduced by the same amount in these two groups, and they did remarkably manage to hit that target here, physical activity is something that, that changed, and the body composition. So I'll show you those data here. In terms of physical activity, we use the ACTI heart monitors. We find them really useful to get a, a valid measure of low to moderate activity in particular, and um, an advantage here is that it does tell you the intensity of activity and critically for us, the timing of when those activities were accumulated too. So on the top figure here, you can see that response. Let's start with the good news. If you're doing standard dieting, you can barely see the bar. So there was no change. Those participants didn't adjust their habitual activity levels when they were just on a standard energy restriction diet. When they were losing the weight through fasting though, you can see that there was a reduction, and in particular, that was occurring during the 24 hours when they were fasting, which makes sense. And the brown part of the bar shows that particularly fasting in the afternoon is when being fasted seemed to restrict that kind of spontaneous low-level activity for these folks. So you miss out on physical activity, 
And then jumping to our DEXA data, again, if we start with the good news story, if somebody is going on a standard diet, reducing their portion sizes by 25% at each meal, but not doing any fasting, over three weeks, you get nearly two kilos of weight loss, but the DEXA informs us that that is almost exclusively adipose tissue mass. The bad news is if you were achieving that weight loss through the fasting-based diet, you lose slightly less weight, but while you're standing on your uh, bathroom scales high-fiving everybody that you've lost weight, what you don't know, unless you have a DEXA scanner at home, is that approximately half of that weight loss is actually fat-free mass, which most people don't want to lose when they're dieting. So it turns out that that hypothesis that fasting would maintain fat-free mass actually, in fact, the opposite is true. And I'm not showing the data here, but in the paper there was no differences between these diets in terms of any of the classical kind of clinical markers of metabolic health. So your cholesterols and uh, glucose and insulin didn't get affected differently by these interventions. Okay, and then the last thing for me to talk about today is this idea of <coughs> nutrient delivery pattern. And this comes back to two things I mentioned earlier. One, I said, well, to separate out the diurnal effects of sleep and food, we'd have to feed people while they were asleep, which seems like a challenging thing to do. And um, it also comes back to this idea of autophagy, which I said I would refer to. So this is Harry Smith, who I've mentioned a couple of times already, fondly known as the night watchman in our department for running these studies. So we're going to employ the same protocol I showed you before with participants in a now not a semi-constant routine because feeding does not stop while they're asleep. We're going to take biopsies around the clock. We're going to maintain the light-dark cycle for these folks. Um, but we're now going to feed them while they're asleep. So we used nasogastric tubes so we can randomize people into two conditions now. In one condition, the nasogastric tube is going to run continuously. The delivery rate was specific to each participant such that they're going to re uh, receive their energy requirements for the day. We were using indirect calorimetry to know their energy requirement and we can meet that minute by minute for 24 hours, including during sleep. So, I mean, I get so excited about that. You can creep into the lab at night time for someone fast asleep eating while they're asleep, and we're going to cut some muscle out and see what's going on. Um, but then the other group that we randomize, they are going to receive the same energy requirements, but in a two bolus model, half at 8 a.m. and half at 8 p.m. The reason I selected two is that I want the most polarized comparison, continuous versus the minimum frequency possible. And you can't have just one bolus because then you haven't got a balance evenly over 24 hours. So Two feeds is the minimum frequency that you can maintain a balance over 24 hours. And aside from our scientific interest here, I should tell you that there are just so many systematic reviews out there in the clinical literature calling for RCTs of this. Anyone you know who's been in critical care and had to be tube fed, which sadly was a lot more people than usual during COVID, but actually there's I think about 10 or 20% of inpatients end up fed this way at some point and they will generally be fed continuously. If it does break, it breaks during the day. So we're completely taking this fragile person, and I assume, because there's no evidence, just to be gentle with them, they're fed slow and steady, when in actual fact then, we're completely throwing their circadian system a curveball, because they're now food is gonna arrive at night, and if it stops, it will stop during the day for any treatments. So. Yeah, needless to say, people are crying out for an RCT to understand better bolus feeding versus continuous feeding, which is the default for no particular reason other than practicalities. Um, so like I said, same protocol as before. We have a cannula in, so we've got lots of blood data, but we also put the CGMS uh, continuous glucose monitors on people for the week before and after. And um, that's just helpful to me to illustrate the protocol. So you can see here with the bolus feeding, well, continuous seems to go under the radar. All of that food's going in, but very little change. So homeostasis, euglycemia maintained. Whereas you can see the spike here with the morning feed, spike with the afternoon. If you're wondering why there's not a second meal effect, which I would, it's because there's 12 hours between them. So it probably doesn't persist that long. And we also know that individuals tend to be more insulin sensitive on waking, which probably explains the lower peak there. So that's the measures in the lab. 
Interestingly though, we fed them the exact same diet the day before they came in and the day after. The groups are a little different even before they come in for the trial, but Harry's just been sending me some of the statistical outputs over the last 24 hours, and it looks like this breakfast response is different the next day. So those who've been bolus fed are not quite so insulin sensitive maybe the next morning, which I'll come back to, but I wonder whether the continuous feeding is almost like I said, sneaking the calories in under the radar and the body essentially has not registered a meal arrival. So this is almost like someone fasted and still very insulin sensitive. Okay, so the last couple of minutes, I'm gonna show you two sets of data from this study then. Uh, unfortunately, the muscle data are not ready. We had transcriptomics all done, but they're still with the bioinformatician. I've been pestering them for the last week to have data for you today, but I don't have that. We have some blood data from this trial, and then I'll finish up with the autophagic flux data. As for the blood data, if we contrast on the left plasma triglycerides and urea, it's interesting to contrast the two because the urea is showing us a very different pattern, but same overall net response, right? They've still got the same amount of nitrogen to excrete over the 24 hours. Whereas with the triglycerides, you see if someone is fed continuously, like they would be in a clinical environment, you get this gradual creep in plasma tag, whereas no such thing when they're having the bolus feed. On the left, I won't talk about the testosterone here because the feeding pattern has really done nothing there, but an interesting thing with going back to our bone resorption marker of CTX is there's no difference between the treatments here, but remember when we looked at that first overnight study where feeding was withheld, there was this big increase in bone turnover at night. So this does tend to suggest then that the rhythm is still present, but the amplitude of it has been suppressed. So a big part of that increase in bone resorption at night is the withdrawal of nutrients. Whereas in both these conditions, they're either being fed or have just had a big feeding before sleep. Okay, and finally, autophagic flux. Um, so autophagy, everybody talks about autophagy. It's been recently shown to have a circadian rhythm in, in mice at least. Um, this is inherently related to nutrient availability. Autophagy is a homeostatic mechanism our cells use to survive when resources, nutrients are varying. So bluntly, if you're fasting, if you're between meals, possibly exercise, and there's limited resource, Autophagy can be used by a cell to be efficient and essentially recycle substrates rather than be wasteful and use them. And that is achieved by having these autophagosomes that are going to engulf sugars or whatever else the cell wants to keep hold of and reuse them. Um, that's generally measured by Western blotting in the muscle of this LC3B protein, which would be a marker of autophagy in the muscle. Again, I don't have the muscle data back today. What I have for you here though, is this autophagic flux data from neutrophils. So at night, at 8, uh, 8 um, p.m. and midnight, Harry, the student who ran this, would have to take the fresh samples and run a four hour assay. So he was essentially up for eight hours through the entire evening. And what they look for in this assay then, is essentially you treat the cells to block the breakdown of the autophagosome and then through the ratio of the LC3B, you get a measure of autophagic flux. How much is your cell trying to recycle and capture? So there might be a rationale here to say, well, this group at their biopsy at eight o'clock had been fed for 12 hours straight. The food is still arriving and we take the biopsy. Whereas this group haven't had any food for 12 hours. So you could have a reasonable hypothesis. This should be higher. But actually it seems fairly clear, a lot of variability here but there is higher autophagic flux in the neutrophils here when the person has been fed continuously. Again, maybe consistent with this idea that by feeding people continuously, you sneak the nutrients in, but it never elicits that meal response that tells the body nutrients available and that you can really switch off these type of processes. So I always have to apologize at the end of a prezi because it's a busy screen at the end, but you can see the journey we've been on talking about meal timing, circadian rhythms and some new data, advocating that more research is done on second and third and fourth meals in the day rather than just testing previously fasted folks. As a practical message today, I think you look to the, this part of the talk in that
Alternate day fasting, if you're doing extreme fasting lengths of 24 hours, really doesn't seem to be advantageous. Um, and then lastly, this was just me taking the liberty to uh, share some of our newest data that will be coming out. But uh, these are the ones that I got sent through yesterday, so I'm still trying to process myself. So with that, I just want to thank you for your attention and thank the members of our Centre for Nutrition, Exercise, Metabolism at Bath, because they all these overnight studies can't be just Harry working at night when he's doing the flow cytometry, I'm doing the biopsies, and we have three other people in the lab all night for every one of those trials. So really, everybody in the group needs thanks for that. So yeah, thank you for your attention, and I think there's questions. Thank you, James.